so welcome to the October uh, Pi Day to Ann Arbor. Um, I just wanted to take a second to thank our sponsors, Num Focus for the meetup, uh, TD Ameritrade for this beautiful space, um, and Midas for the food. Um, and if you have any feedback, um, there is our uh, Twitter handle and our email address, uh, or you can talk to one of the organizers um, if there's anything you wanted to bring up um, about today. Uh, so an important point, so emergency exit. So there's an emergency exit over here, um, and then also back the way you came. Um, like I said, any feedback to uh, the email to one of us. Um, and also, we're in a borrowed space. Please make sure to clean up after yourself. Um, we'd love to keep using it. So, for Q&A at the end, um, and let's uh, quick hold questions until the end. Uh, please phrase your question in the form of a question. Try to keep questions to 30 seconds or less. Avoid long statements or monologues. And there will be time for open discussions after Q&A. So now I'm going to read the Pi Data Code of Conduct. PyData is dedicated to providing a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, religion, or experience. We do not tolerate harassment of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds and levels of experience. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Be kind to others. Do not insult or put down other attendees. Behave professionally. Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for Pi Data. Attendees violating these rules may be asked to leave at the, the meetup at the sole discretion of the meetup organizers. Uh, thank you for making this, for helping make this a welcoming, friendly event for all. Uh, so now we're going to do a quick icebreaker. So turn to someone you don't know, introduce yourself, and our icebreaker from our lovely speaker is... What is your favorite fall activity? Um, so a couple uh, announcements for this month in data science. Uh, so the Midas Symposium is November 13th to the 15th, uh, and you can take a look at their website for more information about that. Uh, there's also a Pi Data Los Angeles in December, uh, which will be at Cal State Los Angeles, and you can take a look at their website as well. Uh, and then on November 2nd, there is a Bay Area Women in Machine Learning and Data Science uh, sponsored uh, sprint. sprint. Sorry, I was like, I'm missing a word here. Uh, sprint, um, which is actually uh, a group that's led by our speaker next month, um, so they're having that uh, in November, and you can take a look. Uh, and our our next event uh, will be Reshima Shake uh, on community building, the good and bad, and that will be Wednesday, November 13th. So now we have an opportunity for anyone out in the community who has, uh, you know, an announcement of any sort. So a job you're looking for, a job you're hiring for, any other sort of announcement. <coughs> Um, my name is Matt. I work for XBO Logistics. We're a trucking company, so we move freight around the country. We're hiring for a data scientist. We have really interesting data problems. It wouldn't sound like it because we're a trucking company, but we do network optimization. We do statistical analysis. We do freight flow optimization. It's, it's incredibly deep. The skills we're looking for are you know one to three years of Python, one to three years of Java, one to three years of SQL. Um, any of those will make you stand out, but basically the ability to verbalize a data problem and turn it into software. So this will be kind of a software-based data science, so maybe data engineer type skill set. Great. Thanks so much, Matt. Amy? Uh, we're still hiring on our team for an AI engineer. Uh, if you have experience in natural language processing or deep learning, it's sort of a little bit more of a senior position, uh, please come to me afterwards. That's okay. Um, it's through interactions. Um, it's on our AI research and data science team. Um, and then also, I run with Dan Pressel the Natural Language Processing Meetup. We have a meetup this October 24th. It's a Thursday in Spark. Um, if you're interested in that, it's on meetup.com. I can also tell you more about it after the talk. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Great, thanks. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm Matt. I'm at Fossil 51. We're kind of a small startup doing AI and video. <laughs> so we're looking for, uh, we're, we have software position, software engineering positions open. We have some uh, data science machine learning positions open as well. Come talk to me or just on our website, fossil51.com, under careers if you're interested. Just uh, throw up your resume there. You can talk to me after if you're interested. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Marcio. I am looking for a job. So I, I, my, my background is in software engineering, um, and my PhD is in computational biology. So my last work was as a data science consultant here at the University of Michigan. I work with clients in uh, traditional statistical analysis, but also certain machine learning techniques, uh, running forest, protecting machines, and machine learning networks. So I had to keep my last job for taking care of my two kids, full-time dad, but I'm looking to re-enter. Um, so I'm looking for data science positions, like coding R, C++, MATLAB, um, Python. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other announcements? Great. Uh, well, now I'm going to introduce our speaker. Tanya Rudakevich uh, is a data scientist at Devoted Health, a new healthcare company offering Medicare Advantage plans, where she focuses on marketing and sales analytics. She previously worked on a team at IBM Watson Health to develop an application for primary care providers. She lives in Boston and likes to read and hike in her spare time. Welcome, Tanya. So the title of my talk is Pipelines That Bend, But Don't Break. Uh, that is focused on um, designing and refactoring pipeline logic over the course of its, its time when we transform data in a repeatable fashion. So I'll go more into depth on that, but first, a little bit more about me. So it's my LinkedIn profile picture. Uh, I am a data scientist at Devoted Health, as, as was mentioned. Um, before that, I was a data scientist on Gemstone, which is a Watson for Patient Care Insights at IBM Watson Health. We worked on a uh, similarity machine learning algorithm that helped pick similar patients to the one the doctor was working with and say what they did well on. Um, and then before that, I worked in health services re research at Boston Children's Hospital, mapping the U.S. healthcare system uh, and consolidation across the U.S. for a research project. So a little bit about Devoted. Um, there are a lot of pictures here. So Devoted Health is, since my example is coming from Devoted, this is important. Um, <laughs> Devoted Health is a Medicare Advantage company. We're fairly young. We've been taking care of members since January. Um, and I'll explain more about what Medicare Advantage is. We're based in Boston, actually in Waltham, a little bit to the west. And right now we take care of members in Florida. And this is a picture of our offices from, from a VentureFizz article and a picture of our website, which you can access. So I didn't have this slide in here, but I was talking to Sean, who's from Canada, and I was like, I should probably give like a quick background on Medicare. Um, so Medicare is the US federal health insurance program for people over 65. You pay in your whole life um, or your working life. Uh, and it also um, covers pe younger people with disabilities and people with end stage renal disease. Medicare has several parts. Uh, part A is your hospital coverage. You know, you go to the ER and you're seen at the hospital, you're in admitted. Part B is your um, seeing your primary care physician um, or any other specialist. Part D is prescription drug coverage. And then Medicare Advantage is sometimes called Part C, which is a little bit confusing, but it covers Part A and B, sometimes Part D, and then additional benefits. And it's the same government benefits, but administered by a private company. So a Medicare Advantage company will administer the Medicare benefits and do all of the claim handling and so on that CMS would usually do. So some important things about Devoted, founding principle kind of things. We put members first, and this affects not only customer care, but also the way we think about analytics and our analytics priorities. Um, we're also very data-centric and technology-centric. We've had data scientists on the team from the beginning. Um, our head of technology is DJ Patel, who is a data scientist under Obama. Um, and uh, we have a pretty robust data team for a company our age and in this space. 
And technology-centric, we also have a very big engineering team, and we build out a lot of systems ourselves, as opposed to contracting with a lot of vendors. And then we're very young. Like I mentioned, we're about two years old, and we've been serving members since January. Um, so this is actually, we're going into our second year as a Medicare company. Just super exciting time. Data changes really quickly. Um, we might see something we need that we didn't realize we needed from this year to last year. Uh, part of that is we actually just expanded to another state. So all the data problems that come with that, moving from, we were just in Florida and now we're in Florida and Texas. So now we have central time um, and many other data things that needed to change. So some examples of systems at Devoted that we get data from. Wah! <laughs> um, so our engineering team built a medical claims processing system. We have member application processing and a full customer relationship management system. So um, who are our prospective members and how have they interacted with us. We also have some integrations with vendors. We get call data from an external vendor and then we have our um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, so this the government arm, CMS. Um, communications are handled through a vendor. And then from, from my perspective, TV marketing management is also handled, uh, handled with, a, with a vendor. So we send them how well or how many calls we're getting from different campaigns, and they decide when to run different slots. So the data team at Tavoted and some of the tools we use uh, I heard last month you also had some airflow in the presentation. So I, I'm going to talk about airflow a little bit again, um, but it's a really important tool here. So we do a lot of things. Uh, one of the things we do is we write the analytics pipelines that power the analytics, the dashboards, and so on. Um, our data warehouse is Snowflake. Um, and which has its own uh, SQL dialect. And we also use Python to do those transformations. So just a quick background on Airflow. Uh, Airflow runs directed acyclic graphs, these DAGs, which basically tell you when different parts of the transformation run and how they depend on each other. So here's an example of a DAG, um, my example marketing DAG. And from this example, you can see campaign level lookup. Um, these are all SQL scripts in this example, but they could also be Python operators. Um, we have a mix in most of the pipelines. So campaign level lookup would run first and create a campaign level table. Then calls and lead forms depend on campaign level lookup. And then responses would call on the calls and lead form submissions. And these are all laid out in some kind of uh, usually Python, but we also have a YAML template that we sit on top of it to, to put out what dependencies are there and how things move from one to the other. So, and then we build these pipelines and then we can build dashboards on top of them. And we use Periscope. It's very similar to Looker or um, Tableau where you have a SQL layer to extract and transform the data and then some kind of UI to create a graph. And there we use Snowflake SQL to hit the warehouse. And uh, this dashboard is an example from the Periscope website. But ours look pretty similar. And then we also do some integrations with our engineering application layer, which is written in Go. Um, typically, these are queries to the warehouse that need to go to an external place, um, like a provider group or, uh, or a vendor. But these can also be um, at some point, data products feeding back into the Go layer. So here's an example of the way our analytics pipelines work at Devoted a Diagram. So we have source data, and source data can come from a few different places, but mainly it comes from our Go application layer. So this is the claims processing and the uh, application management that I mentioned earlier. We make a copy of the source data into Snowflake, with the ETL processes. And then there's a set of analytics pipelines that are run on Airflow DAGs that create analytics tables. And then the goal is to build most of our analyses, which typically Periscope layer, off of those analytics tables. 
An example of an analytics table, um, this is one that is quite popular and drives a lot of uh, reports, is a member month table. So in this example, we have just one member, member one, and two months where they were active, January and February. And we also see they switched P uh, primary care providers, PCP. Um, so in January, they were with Mary Shelley. And then in Mar or February, they were with Mark Brown. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of things that, a lot of questions you can get off of this table much more easily than off of a source table that had one row per member. Things like, uh, how many members did we have with Mary Shelley in February? It's a very specific question. Um, but also, how many active members did we have in each month is a question that you really want to know to see over time. So that's this chart at the bottom is kind of a mock of what that might look like. What do I do at Devoted? So I am on the sales and marketing team. Uh, and I build marketing uh, and sales pipelines and dashboards, mainly to see how well different campaigns are doing and with what people. Um, so how well different campaigns, how well different agents, uh, just metrics around sales performance. And it's an example. This is actually a chart I built. I, I built the member month table at the very beginning. So. And this talk in particular is going to focus on this analytic pipeline arrow. So the ones that we're running in DAGs. Basically, we have a, uh, I'm going to talk about a table that we had that was at the prospect level and tracked all of the significant milestones in a prospect's sales timeline and how we ended up changing that, refactoring that code to work better over time and what things we thought about during that and what things we think about going forward in situations like this. And the reason I thought to do this talk, oh well. So this is our particular use case uh, with analytics pipelines, but I also think this kind of design and refactoring framework is relevant if you're just working from source data or a copy of the source data to an analysis or even if you're building features in a repeatable way where you might want to add features in the future or run the same model in a week on new data. Um, this kind of uh, repeatable transformation is, leads to code issues that you need to think about and resolve kind of constantly. So while I was preparing for this talk, I came across a guide by Dr. Ernst um, at University of Washington on giving technical presentations. And he was more talking about um, for research purposes, but I also thought it was quite relevant. He said there were three things you need to convince an audience of in order to have a good presentation. The first uh, is that it's worthwhile. Um, second is that it's hard. And third is that it's solved. So I'm going to try and convince you of these things over the course of the presentation, but I also wanted to get a leg up and just say right off why I think these things are true at the beginning. Um, so this is worthwhile. Cleaning up data pipelines, thinking about design from the beginning, modularizing, and then refactoring in order to make things uh, um, clean is worthwhile because it saves a lot of time, a lot of debugging, um, a lot of testing time. We ended up saving qu quite a lot of time. It also makes the code a lot cleaner um, for if you want to onboard someone new to the project who doesn't have the, the history that you do. It's hard because we want to build to a particular use case at the beginning. And I'm sure everyone's had an experience where you're building a model and you have a set of features at the beginning that you want to use. So you create the SQL or the Python to create those features. And then later when you're adding a new feature, it doesn't quite fit into the script that you made to start. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, of pressure and, and that creates this tendency to um, go straight towards the problem that you are working at from the beginning without thinking about where it might be in the future. And then it's solved. Uh, <laughs> I would say this is a good framework to think about it. So it's solved in the sense that this framework has helped us a lot. I would not say that our pipelines are perfect <laughs> or uh, thinking about this makes perfect pipelines. But I think it's kind of an ongoing process and learning process that uh, I've had over the course of my career so far. 
So the beginnings of prospect funnel. So this is the example I'm going to go through with the prospect level table. Let me start by explaining what happens operationally in marketing at Devoted. Here's an example of a campaign that we ran last year on YouTube. Um, the important thing about this campaign from an operational perspective, so a prospect is watching YouTube and sees this campaign come up and decides that this is something they're interested in. So they give this number a call at the bottom. This number routes to our telesales line. So then they talk with an agent. The agent uh, convinces them that it's a good idea to set up an appointment, checks that they're qualified and so on. And they set up an appointment with a field sales agent. It's kind of complicated just because the nature of Medicare is just a, it's a, it's a, it's less of a consumer product and more of a decision you make for your life. Um, so people want to talk to people on the phone and then in person. So you might set up an appointment with a field sales agent. You go meet with them at a provider office or um, at your home or at a Duncan. There's all kinds of things that happen in sales. And you talk with the field sales agent and decide that devoted is right for you. And then you apply. So that's what happens operationally. On the data side, yes? Um, you said this is on YouTube, right? Uh-huh. And we're probably one channel. Out of the, do you do demographics? I was wondering how many 65 plus are watching YouTube and how many of their kids are referring <laughs> to this. Uh, do you have any sense of that? Yeah, so that is a complicated data problem because we can't get the demographics until we talk to the person, right? Um, so we do have demographics for the people we talk to. Uh, who are willing to tell us how old they are and so on. Um, but we do have a set of calls that we'll never know if it was a qualified person who called. Um, but there are, so we do have some digital channels and there are people who are qualified who are on the channels. But I will say direct mail is probably our biggest. Um, in, in the industry in general, it's pretty well known that direct mail is the way to reach people who are over 65 usually. Um, but that doesn't mean diversifying is, is bad. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you get referrals by the son to the parents? Totally. Um, so yeah, so to follow up on that, uh, it could totally happen that somebody calls in um, to this number and says, hey, my, my dad is interested, and then leaves a callback number for their dad. I, I think the more likely situation is they would send their parent the number to talk um, to us. But we do sometimes talk to, to the children if they are in the telesales process. They don't have to be uh, appointed to talk to us. But, but when they're members, that we do need like a, an official appointee in order to talk about medical information with a child. Does that answer? OK. Any other questions? OK. So from a data perspective, there's something like 10 to 20 tables that go into this. But here's a couple of examples. So uh, one, we might have, and we do have, a table that stores marketing number to campaign. So when somebody calls in from a certain marketing number, I can say, OK, that's campaign um, FL180. Um, the state is Florida. Here's the channel. And some other metadata about it. This is an English ad. Um, so that's kind of a lookup table. And then we also have data on who called in when. So here we can see somebody called this marketing number at this time. And that's how we can kind of link who called different campaigns. And as you can see, uh, to your point, sometimes our prospect ID is null. So if we don't get data from them, we just know a call came into that channel, but we can't link who it was or whether they were qualified. So with all of this data, we thought about the kind of units that we wanted to track. And what we came up with was a prospect level table, what campaign they, they responded into, who they talked to, and then kind of the outcome. So was there an appointment and was there an application? And this is how we envisioned it when we, when we set out. And at the beginning, uh, we started off making this a little over a year ago before we were using Airflow. Um, our warehouse was Redshift. Um, and a lot of this actually happened in the Periscope layer. So one thing that happened, at, so in the Periscope layer, you can create views. Um, so views are kind of, just in case to, to make sure everyone's on the same playing field, views are like 
temporary tables that only exist in your session. Um, and you can create those in Periscope. So we had a, uh, a set of Periscope views that did this matching logic. It's not super sustainable, <laughs> and which is one of the reasons we decided to move it into pipelines on Airflow once we got Airflow. Uh, in the middle, we were actually running cron jobs, SQL scripts on, on, um, in, in bash, saying like when each one would run and which would run after the others. Airflow definitely improved that. So some decisions from the start. The situation I outlined was kind of the most straightforward thing that happens. Data is never super straightforward. Uh, so what happens if somebody calls in for multiple campaigns or multiple times to the same campaign before they apply? And this is campaign attribution. It's a really common marketing problem. So here, say somebody called into that YouTube ad in August and then decided they didn't want to make an appointment. And then a month later, they called in for a different YouTube ad, and then they decide to apply and go through the whole process. Do we give credit to the first campaign, because that's what presumably how they heard about us the first time? Or do we give credit to the campaign that brought them in? Or do we do some kind of waiting system? And a lot of companies do this differently. There are like parabolic methods where you wait the first and last and less in the middle. Um, but this was a decision that we came up against very quickly. So, uh -huh. so you have multiple campaigns. Do you run that same time, or they are like shifted out? And if you only have one number that is associated, the one call number, how do you uh, tag them up to different campaigns that they're associated with? Yeah, so campaigns can run concurrently. In fact, we're usually running um, at least a dozen campaigns in like different mediums. But each one has a different number. So this we use as a lookup. So if somebody calls in to this number, we know it goes to this campaign. Uh, we try not, to, or we don't use over numbers at the same time overlapping, but we do reuse numbers. So we usually have a time period on this table as well. But that's um, really important. So does that answer? OK, cool. Um, so that question, what happens if somebody calls in for multiple campaigns? You would think it wouldn't come up a lot. It totally comes up a lot. We have some people with 20 responses, some of them to the same campaign, like somebody sees a YouTube ad and calls in five times from the same ad. Uh, you, it's hard to predict a clean way that people will behave in, in data. <laughs> um, and then what happens, oh, and so I should say what we did with this at the beginning. So we were creating a prospect level table. Uh, we decided to use first campaign to start out. So the first campaign that touches a prospect, we would say that's how they heard about us. We're going to give the application to that campaign. Um, and I'll, I'll show what that looks like in a second. And then what happens if someone has more than one appointment or more than one application? That's another thing you're like, OK, so once they make the purchase or so on, that is a cycle. And we want a different cycle. Um, but we have a bunch of people who might sign up for an appointment, decide they don't want to apply then. Um, and then like a month later, they decide to meet with the sales agent again, do another appointment. Which would we store in the table? Um, and this is important for metrics like time from their response to the appointment, things that we might want to track. Um, if, so we also decided to do first appointment and first application. So first application, if your application is denied, you might apply again. Um, if you apply with us, become a member, disenroll, decide to apply again. That's another thing that can happen. So here's what prospect funnel started looking like. So a row for each prospect, the first campaign that brought them in, the first appointment, and the first application. So you can see there's some limits to this, right? There's a lot of data that's missing from this table that we're kind of cutting out along the way. Um, but it worked for us for a while, especially for our first. Medicare is very cyclic, so Medicare Advantage. Mm -hmm. So you can apply in the fall. In fact, we just opened up yesterday. So most people can apply only in the fall. Um, so we had our first sales cycle. A lot of this worked for being a lot of prospects' first contact with us, which made sense. And then it grew. So code grows. Um, I'm sure anyone who's had to either maintain someone else's code or uh, work with the same piece of code over a period of years. 
Um, in, in our pipelines, how it ended up growing was we would get further questions. So uh, things like the time between the response and the appointment, or um, incorporating a piece of data about a prospect. And it grew to be a little bit untenable as a, as a pipeline um, script. We ended up with, I mean, here I'm showing four columns. There were actually about 70 um, by the time we decided to refactor. Uh, our SQL ended up being about 700 lines of SQL. Um, and we used a lot of common table expressions, so CTEs, which are kind of like subqueries. Um, in that they create a table that only exists for the query. So we had about 30 of those uh, in order to construct that end 70, 70 column table. So here's a more general list about signs it was time to refactor, which I think are relevant whether you're doing pipelines or uh, transforming data in some other way. These are just some things that we started noticing. So we started to get a lot of need for intermediate data. Remember, we're starting here, the lookup and then the calls, and going straight to this without exposing any tables in between. So some of the questions we started getting, um, which made a lot of sense, and we ended up um, changing to adjust for these, but how many calls did we get from campaign 370? So from this table, I could tell you at least two. Uh, potentially infinite, right? So maybe prospect one, the first com campaign they called into is 370, uh, and then they called into 370 20 more times. So technically we got 22 calls for campaign 370, but only two prospects. And that's data that we lost moving from the source data to here. Um, another example is if I wanted to know how many people called into campaign 380. So on this table, the answer is none. But maybe prospect two called into 370 first and then called into 380 a month later and then applied. So in this table, we can't tell that at all. And 380 looks like it didn't do anything. So explaining and documenting the code grew harder. Uh, this is something that can happen no matter how well you refactor, or, um, how you think about setting things up. But we, we had a particularly hard time because of all of the CTEs. So if you're a new developer coming onto this pipeline and you want to make a change, so my example change here is I want to add the prospect zip code at the time of the call so I can know whether they were eligible. So ideally, I would add this. The, here's an example of two CTEs. One is a call CTE, and the other one is a prospect CTE. Um, so ideally, I would add zip code for the prospect to the call level CT, because technically if a prospect called in multiple times and gave us different zip codes, it could change over time. But zip code is stored in the prospect table, probably in, in the history, the way the table changed over time. And we query that somewhere else with a different purpose. So if I'm not careful, I could end up querying the same source table like 10 different times in different ways. Um, and it's not very clear where I should query in order to get the data at the level that I want it for this. Changes were becoming really hard to test and debug. So uh, testing, here's a picture of Airflow and, and the DAGs again. Um, the way we would test this is the table would run all at once. So when we got to 700 lines with some CTEs that took a while to run because they had some pretty complicated logic. Um, it ended up taking a really long time to test because we would run the table to see if it ran. It would take 45 minutes, and then it would fail. And you're like, okay. So something I did broke it. I would go back in, make another change, run it again to see if it passed, and it would fail again. Uh, and so this, this testing would end up taking quite a lot of time, even for very small changes. And it's worse if you're making a bigger change and you don't know what part of it broke because all of the CTEs run in the same query. Debugging, even if it runs, 
sometimes you might introduce a join that creates duplicates. So here we have all of our prospect rows became duplicated at some point in my query. Um, and how I would go about debugging this when it was all one big SQL script was I would run the first CT I changed, um, the first kind of subquery, see if that created duplicates, then run the first and the second together, did that create duplicates, all the way down until I found where I introduced the duplicate, if it was a big change. And as you can imagine, quite time intensive, not super good at pinpointing things. Um, and then there were changes in the business logic that didn't fit cleanly into the model we'd set up. So this is a situation where if you're getting features for a machine learning model and you're adding new features that don't fit with the same ones you started with. For us, what this looked like was response uh, or campaign attribution. So I mentioned we were using attribution to the first response. At some point, talking with the marketing team, they're like, you know, I think we want to incorporate the other responses. And we were like, OK. Uh, so we created this table that has one row per prospect. What do we do if a prospect has 20 responses? How are we supposed to store that in that type of table? Um, obviously, this would not work. Uh, this could you know, go on forever. Um, but people who uh, are used to moving from wide to long tables might notice this is a great candidate for something like that. And that's kind of the direction we realized we were going to have to move, is instead of a row for each prospect and a column for each campaign, we would have a row for each response, what campaign it was and what prospect it came from. So here you can see prospect one had two responses to the same campaign, 370. And then I added a sequence, one and two. Prospect two also had two responses to two different campaigns. So then the question was, since prospect funnel, the prospect level table is not super well suited to the data we were moving towards, do we tear it down or do we refactor? So on the tear it down side, it was pretty clear that prospect funnel was not going to work for response-based campaign attribution. So if we wanted to have um, some amount of e each application go to each response. Um, why refactor? So prospect funnel was in use. Uh, we didn't want there to be a blackout period where marketing couldn't see how well their campaigns were doing while we decided to create something new. Comparing data. So we could see how well campaign 370 did on prospect funnel and say, look, it did way better on a response-based attribution. Maybe we should look into why that is. Like, is it getting a lot of multiple responses and so on um, and how how did our switch affect the way we see our campaigns and how they performed? And then what if we decided to go back? So we were still experimenting with different types of response attribution. And there was a chance that the marketing team would be like, you know what? We're getting a lot of duplicate response, or not duplicates, but like uh, multiple responses to the same campaign. And we don't want to split it like that. We, we decided we want to go back to that first touch. So then we have a table structure, and we don't want to lose that. The good news is that response level table I showed, it's super easy to get from that to prospect funnel. And in fact, we ended up rebasing prospect funnel on the response table. So if you take this response table and just select where the sequence is one, you have a prospect level table with the first response. Ta-da. Um, so some things we thought about when we were refactoring, because we had 700 lines of SQL and over 30 CTEs, and basically we wanted to split that up and make it easier to manage. Um, so here's a few examples of CTEs that we had going on. I know I have been talking about calls, but now I'm going to switch over to lead form submissions, and I promise I will go back to calls. So lead form submissions can come through a, a digital source. So basically, you land on a page, you fill out your information, and then somebody calls you. Um, so here I have a CTE to say, here are all my lead form submissions. I have a CTE to pick the first one. These are based on real ones that we had in Prospect Funnel. 
Um, I have a CTE to get that campaign level lookup, so the data I need to get the campaign from the lead form data. And then I have a link from lead form to campaign. And you start to see the dependencies between these CTEs. So here, first lead form is querying all the lead form submissions. Um, and then lead form to campaign is querying both first lead form and campaign level lookup. So ideally, I could run these first two concurrently, then run first lead form, and then run lead form to campaign. Calls, we have a similar pattern. So we have the call responses, first call. That campaign level lookup also contains the data to link from a marketing number to a campaign. And then we end up with all of the calls and what campaign they were from. And it starts to look kind of like a DAG, right? We, if we called out these dependencies explicitly, um, it would be a lot clearer what was happening. So this made us think we should take these CTEs, break them up into tables, put them on a DAG. And there were some questions about that. So first, the benefits. So by now, it should be pretty clear what the benefits are, but I, I want to call them out. Like The benefits of breaking into tables on a DAG, the dependencies are clear. This was huge. The dependencies in the CTEs, we would have to see what CTE was querying what prior CTEs versus here, and this is a, a YAML template that we use, but the DAG builder, or, or the DAGs in general, um, uh, do explicitly call out dependencies. So here I'm saying responses depends on calls and lead form submissions. Each table runs separately so we can see when something fails. So before, when we would run the whole thing together and a CTE would fail, we would just see that the entire script failed. Here, I could see, OK, so campaign level lookup had no problems. And then I got to calls, and calls didn't work out. And then, of course, intermediate data access, which is huge. So if I want to know how many calls came from a campaign, I can query the call table that's created in that script. So each of these, ins instead of creating a temporary table that only exists for a query, would create a table that exists in the warehouse as a prep table. Or a staging table, or whatever words you use for that. Um, so then the question was, which CTEs should get their own tables? Because 30 tables would be a lot to manage. Um, and not every table necessarily needs to be called out. So here we thought about two things. And one was what intermediate data was the most important to have access to. So definitely the response level data and what campaign that response came from. And then whether each response resulted in an application. So all of the process of linking an application and downstream success metrics to a response. And then what building blocks, um, what tables would most easily allow for change in the future. So one of the things that was up in the air for us was response attribution. So we definitely wanted to have a t one table, preferably, where we did the response attribution in a way where we can change it down the line. And I'll show you what that ended up looking like for us. But first, here's a kind of an example of what the DAG ended up looking like. It's a little bit bigger than this. But as we noticed, calls and lead forms both had were treated similarly after they became um, responses. So we have the campaign level lookup running first, then calls and lead form submissions running off of that, incorporating the campaign data. And then once they are combined into responses, we get the applications after that response. And then we combine it into an outcomes table. And then after that, we can reconstruct co prospect funnel. And, re and that's the refactoring part. So here's an example of response outcomes, which is how we decided to store the campaign attribution. So in this case, uh, this is an example of an even split, just because it's easy to show here. So prospect one um, gave us response one and response two. And then they filed an application. And those responses were to two different campaigns. So an example of a question I could ask from this table. So each, each campaign gave us half an application in this, because we split it evenly. So I could ask uh, how many applications were driven by campaign 2370. And the answer here would be half of prospect 1s and all of prospect 2s, so 1 and a half. 
Um, so here it would be clear that campaign 2370 outperformed 2380. And then reiterating, again, we could select one from response outcomes to get prospect funnel, basically. So if we build off of that first row and the third row, we have one line per prospect. And if applications is greater than zero, I know they applied. So I can give that full one to the, to the campaign. So some things we learned and things that we think about now when we're setting up a pipeline and as it grows. So the first question is, what are the smallest logic blocks for this pipeline? So even though we built at a prospect level to begin with, responses ended up being a smaller logical block. And in effect, we ended up combining those together into the creation of the prospect table without exposing the responses themselves. How do the blocks depend on one another? So this is the DAG, the, the, um, the dependencies. And in fact, if you are treating something similarly, like we realized calls and lead forms are types of responses, so down the line, we could just manipulate responses. Um, that's something to call out in your dependencies. Dependencies. Uh, what intermediate data might you want to access for testing or for analytics purposes? So for us, that was how many responses came from a campaign, how many calls, um, different types of responses. Uh, but this is also relevant if you're building features for a machine learning model and might need descriptives at some point. What kind of um, intermediate data might you want to call out for, uh, for unblackboxing it? Um, or if you might need them as features themselves down the line. How will business logic change in the future? This is the same idea as uh, changing our response attribution or our campaign attribution, um, or like adding another feature to a, pipe, to a machine learning pipeline. And then how will the source data change in the future? So for us, we actually added a response type in the past couple of months. Um, we started collecting data on sales events. So this is when uh, a sales agent meets up with prospects in person. And because of the way we broke out prospect funnel, we could create a sales event table and just treat it as any other type of response for attribution. So it saved us a lot of development time down the line. What does it look like today? Um, code grows. So now it's a lot of tables. Um, this is a, a small snapshot of it. But we still run into the issues where we have a big chunk of code that's doing a thing, and we break it up into smaller tables. And then we also have times when we have um, two tables that we don't really need the intermediate data from, from the middle one, and we combine them together. So it's kind of a balance that's, that's ongoing. And it um, powers things like our marketing top line dashboard, where we can see things like how much we spent over time on different campaigns and different channels and how those performed, um, which is super vital to our marketing operation when we decide where to, um, where to market and what channels to market through. So some future things. This is, I say it's the future, but our data engineering team already built this out and we're super excited to incorporate it. We have some data integrity checks that we can build in, or we can run in between tables in Airflow. So things like, are there duplicates in the table I just ran? Is an entire column null? So checking those things that wouldn't necessarily call, cause my pipeline to fail, but would eventually cause it to, to fail operationally. Um, so this is an example you can see uniqueness validation, which is things like checking for duplicates. Um, name validation, so checking that the names are within a certain set of values. And these are things that uh, we would code up and put into the DAG when we specify it, um, what to run. Thank you guys so much. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, thank you to Sean Law and to Rose and all the organizers. Um, and special thank you to my team at Devoted and uh, Andrew Hoffman, who worked on this project. Um, below, I put my LinkedIn and Twitter handles, so feel free to connect with me. I would love to hear from you on times you've experienced something related to this. Um, and questions? Hi. So uh, one question I had, so when you build out all 
all these intermediate tables. Yeah. Uh, do you have any knowledge about who are the consumers of these, like other data scientists within your org, et cetera? And around that, what kinds of like API guarantees or like these are public and you can depend on them mm -hmm. or not? Can you repeat the questions? Yes, yes, absolutely. So yeah, so the question is when we build out these intermediate tables, um, who are the consumers? Um, and who, how do we uh, guarantee things like API guarantees to those consumers? Um, so the way we do it is we specify whether an intermediate table is a final table or a staging prep table. Um, if it's a staging prep table, the only people who access it are people who are building on the pipeline. Um, if it's a final table, you can query it uh, in our Periscope layer, so you can create reports off of it. Um, you can query it from other pipelines. So if you are working in claims and have something that depends on marketing for some reason, you might have to do an external uh, task. Uh, our guarantees, I think, are limited to the testing framework that we put in place. So this validity uh, that I mentioned here, and we also are implementing a kind of SQL testing framework um, on the data engineering team. I, our users are limited to analysts and data scientists at Devoted, so we're not exposing this to um, an external, like very external, where we would need to guarantee API-wise. Does that answer? Absolutely. OK, great. How, if at all, were you able to validate your campaign attribution approaches? Was, were the prospects asked anything like, have you called before, and why are you calling me? something like that? Or is there a feedback loop? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great question. And follow up, yeah. could you use that? If, if, if you could, could you use that to influence the types of campaigns? Yeah, let, let me repeat the question, and let me know if I got this right. So uh, what ways can we validate our response to campaign linking? Um, and is there some kind of feedback loop? Like if we asked prospects, did you call us before? Um, we do ask prospects where they heard about us, so like a self-reported source. We don't use that as much because it's less reliable to us than a number that they call in on. I think that's a great idea as far as incorporating it, but I, we're not um, validating via the conversations we have with prospects right now. But we could. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Do you see this uh, being able to? Uh, are you thinking about any sort of streaming application or re near real time application for predicting something for a prospect in real time for you know someone on the phone uh, and does this sort of approach support that kind of real time data transformation? Right now, we're limited by the uh, ETL copy um, from the the application data to our warehouse. I think real-time data products are something we've talked about. I'm not sure at the prospect level. I think we would be doing more for members first. But um, could this support it? I think there'd have to be a lot of infrastructure in place to support live data in the first place. Um, and then as far as data pipelines running, then runtime becomes a huge thing. Right now, runtime is not really much of an issue except on a debugging testing side. But if we're doing real time, it would be, you know, it would have to run fast enough that the application could consume it and show it quickly. So I think we're pretty far from there, but that would be a cool place to be. You talked about different campaign to prospect attribution schemes like mm -hmm. Okay, let me repeat the question because I forgot to do that on the last one. Um, so this is, uh, how do we assess the prospect to uh, like campaign attribution strategies? So parabolic versus first response versus even. Um, we have a tool to compare the way output looks when we run different scripts. Um, we're not running that in a repeated way across different uh, attribution strategies right now, but that's something I could see us doing. Um, 
I think our approach right now is closer to what the marketing team needs, and as their needs change, we would change it. But right now, they haven't decided to do a deeper investigation into uh, the benefits and downfalls of each type. Um, and it's kind of hard because there's not really a success metric on that. Um, there's just pitfalls that you would look out for. So to, I, I think optimizing that would be kind of hard. It would just be like a kind of qualitative, what does a run look like from each of these and what kind of uh, factors do we see when we change the attribution strategy? But I think it would be cool to do it. Does that answer? So I'm not a data engineer, and I'm not super qualified to talk on what we preferred in Snowflake over Redshift. I can tell you Snowflake is running faster for me, um, and I love being able to undrop things uh, as somebody who has accidentally dropped tables before. Um, Snowflake basically, they, they store like a 24-hour backup, so you can run undrop as a command. <laughs> um, I've, run, I've ran a couple of Python scripts that were doing that in the background and then panicked um, when it dropped a table. But uh, as far as the pros and cons, I think a di data engineer would be better to talk to about that. <coughs> yeah. Um, I don't remember who was first, but uh, yeah. Um, Thanks, Charlie. Do you have some, some schema for, for managing the relationship between um, campaigns and phone numbers? Because I can imagine that if, you know, like, if it takes a person a while to call a phone number or you know, like, you know, it'd be hard to make sure that you know what phone number belongs to what campaign unless you're really careful with that. Totally. Uh, repeating the question because I forgot to do it again. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, do we have some schema for management of marketing numbers to campaigns? Um, because it's a really tricky problem. It's totally a tricky problem. Um, our goal eventually is to manage that in an application layer. Um, so the, the marketing team would input um, the campaign and how long it's running and so on. We do, there's, there's all kinds of pitfalls with the way we run marketing number to campaign. A, a good example is if there's, we get a call from a marketing number, but there's no active campaign at the time. So it's something like, Somebody got a direct mailer back in October, put it on their fridge, and called us in March, uh, which happens. And then we're like, OK, so we haven't reused that number, but can we attribute it to that direct mail campaign? Um, right now, the way we manage it is pretty rudimentary. Um, but I think we're looking into better management systems going forward. Um, we are thinking of using, there's like a dynamic one for digital that dynamically generates a phone number for uh, depending on what user is on the page. We haven't implemented that yet, but that'll be a, another level to this. Any final question, John? Just a high level question about devoted health. What makes devoted yeah. health special compared to these huge, gigantic insurance companies like Blue Cross Blue Shield or uh, Anthem? Like what makes, uh, well, how do you treat your members? differently than those, that yeah. you have all these data, smart data scientists, well, Chris Album, DJ Patel, mm -hmm. what makes you special to deliver? It's a great question. Um, so I think there are a lot of things, um, but the two that come to mind are the data and technology focus. Uh, so we have a faster claim turnaround than the industry standard, and if, which is good for provider service. We have a faster credentialing system, just because we're focused on developing those technologies and building things in-house where we can. Um, from a member service perspective, we focus a lot on talking to members. So we don't have like the answering machine that gives you the data, uh, or like the, it, you can go to our online portal. We don't have a member online portal. We want to talk to people directly, and we put a lot of resources into making sure that our phones are adequately staffed to do so. Um, and then we emphasize in our materials that people should call us. And we give the, the customer service people a lot of power um, to do things for the members. But it is a complicated question. Um, and I wish I could give you a more thorough answer, but I will say the actual focus on members and member experience is a cultural thing that runs very deep at Devoted. Um, there have been decisions that were made that were 
maybe not great financially for the company, but better for the member. Um, and I've seen that happen again and again. And it's, it's, it's a good place to be. So talking more to the members will make them healthier. Is that your hypothesis? <laughs> Being more available to members. I will say, so you asked about customer service versus like making people healthier, um, which I think are two different questions. We also do, uh, we have our own medical group that supplements um, fee-for-service systems. So uh, the kind of traditional healthcare model where a doctor is paid for each service that they give somebody. Um, and then we do want to work with risk-based providers and try to provide special payer care for that which I think is more on the health side, how we want to make people healthier. We, we think that risk is important um, in value-based care. And I'm happy to talk more offline afterwards if you want. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank Tanya again for a great talk. Hey, thanks everybody.